Hello, I'm Jeremy, and today I'm going to be taking a look at a game by the name of Red Peak. This is put out by Ravensburger. Um, I have a multilingual edition. I imported this from Germany, but it does have English rules in it. Uh, the game is a cooperative adventure game where two to six players are going to be um, adventurers who are trying to escape a volcanic island before a flow of uh, lava gets them. Uh, there was a game recently that came out last year by the name of Fuji, uh, which had the exact same theme. This one is a very similar game um, in many respects, but it's definitely aimed more at a, a family market, I would say. The game plays in about 20 or 30 minutes, and like I said, it's between two to six players. Box has ages 8 and up, which I think is about right. Maybe even younger players could be play, playing as well since it is a cooperative game, um, as long as there's somebody older to, to guide the rules. Let me take a few minutes to show you how the game plays, and then I'll come back and I will let you know what I think about it. So Red Peak is a cooperative game for between two to six players, where players are going to be controlling this group of adventurers. They're represented by this uh, meeple, this little explorer meeple. And they want to get from this base camp up here to the shore here where there will be a boat waiting for them. And they want to get away from this island which they were exploring before the volcano that they've uh, uh, discovered essentially coats them with lava. Over the course of the game they'll be building a path using these tiles over, you know, down towards the beach. But over the course of the game also these lava tiles are going to be coming out and filling up that path. So essentially chasing the team of adventurers over the uh, jungle. So if they make it to the boat and escape before the lava hits them, they'll win. If the lava overtakes them, the players will lose. So the game is a real-time game, and it's, like I said, play between two to six players, and it's divided into phases. So there's essentially going to be a phase where players are going to be, in real time, plotting out their path and uh, playing um, cards that show tools on them. So you can see that essentially this one, for example, has a hat and a machete on it. So to move on to that space, players are going to need to play cards that show a hat and a machete. Um, and they'll be doing that cooperating with other players in real time, make it, coming up with those tools to move ac across tiles. And then there'll be a night phase where players are going to essentially um, evaluate the bonuses on each of these tiles, which will also cause the lava to flow. So it'll alternate between those two phases, essentially real-time movement phases and then evaluation phases for the night. So at the start of the game, you're going to lay out this board. It is two-sided. There's a more difficult side. I'll show that at the end of the video. You'll put this timer here um, as, long, as well as three of these um, tokens, these time tokens. I'll explain those in one moment. You'll put a stack of these boats here. Start with three of these wild tool markers and seven uh, land tiles, which uh, will be face up. They are communal resource for the players. You'll also stack these volcano tiles up here by the volcano. Those will come out during the course of the game. Then uh, you will take 12 of these tool cards. Uh, these essentially each show uh, three different tools. So they could be this could be used as a canteen, a compass, or a flashlight, not as two of those things. Essentially, each card can only be used once for one of its three possible uses. Um, and you'll take 12 of those and uh, shuffle those up, uh, deliver them to the players, dividing them equally as possible, face down. Players are not allowed to look at those until the actual real-time element of the game begins. And so once the, the uh, timer... Uh, or once you're ready to go into the timer phase, what you'll do is you'll take that and flip that over onto the first marker. And this will be about a 90 second timer. And what players will have to do then is they could begin to look at their cards uh, privately, but what they cannot do is describe to other players uh, exactly, or show other players exactly what's on those cards. They could describe them, but they can't actually show the cards face up. Um, I suppose if you want to have a more... Uh, uh, friendly variant you could do that just to learn the game but um, players will basically you know so if you had four players 12 cards each player would have three cards and what they'll be trying to do is say okay we should put this tile here maybe this tile here and looking at the requirements of that card so for example there are like I said there are only straight and curved path tiles this one for example in order to move on to that players will have to have a med kit and a rope so a player could propose that as part of the path, say, you know, I think we could take, you know, does I have the med kit, does somebody have the rope? Maybe somebody will say yes, and then the next player could, you know, play this one. And it, this is done, in, like I said, in real time with players cooperating and, and verbalizing what they have in their hand. So maybe they would lay down three tiles thinking that they have 
all of these on the cards that they have. Then what will happen, and this is still during the real-time phase of the game, once you've laid down as many tiles as you want to for that action phase, is that you'll then start moving the guy and playing the cards to, um, to meet the requirements on there. So this one requires a med kit and a rope. And there are quite a few different symbols on here. So even though you have 12 cards between you, you may not have all of them. So maybe one player will say, oh, here's a med kit. This player might say, here's a rope. And you'll have to really cooperate at, because although this one has a rope on it, you might need, for example, the compass for this tile here. So somebody else might need to play their rope. But obviously this is something that you is easier to demonstrate with more players. So you've succeeded on that. Then maybe you move here and, you know, as a team, somebody plays the... Uh, the canteen and somebody plays the hat and somebody would need to play a flashlight so we've met those three requirements there so flashlight hat canteen and then here we need another canteen a walking stick and a rope so we would have um the walking stick on there we would have um, it looks like we don't have collectively a rope or a canteen. So um, whenever you are missing those, you could actually pay these tokens to make up for it. Again, these are just one-time use wilds, essentially, and then you would be able to meet that requirement. If you didn't meet that requirement, you would just stop your movement, and then these tiles would, would go away, essentially the ones that you weren't able to meet the requirements for. So once that would once you've gotten to the last tile that you're able to get to then that will end the day phase what you'll do is you'll check is there time left in the timer if so that's fine the timer will just stay on the current marker if you exceeded the amount of time that you had again it's about 90 seconds as a penalty this will move up one space so um you want to generally do all of your planning and all of your movement within that 90 seconds so once you've gotten to the end then, it's the night phase where you're going to essentially evaluate these tiles. So what you'll do is you'll move each, the tent one space at a time to catch up to the adventurer and you'll evaluate the little bonus markers that are on here. So this one, for example, uh, gives you one extra time tile, which is great since you theoretically would have burned one there. Then this one here, you can see, gives you two cards and one extra top path tile. So you get one extra path tile. Again, that goes face up. It's communal. And then you'll get two cards and you'll divide these as evenly as possible among players. Again, remaining face down until the actual um, uh, movement phase um, so that you want to make sure that people have as, as evenly as possible number of cards. So these would get split among the players. And then this one, three more cards would come out. Another tile. And then the third thing that's listed here is actually the lava icon. So you can see here the uh, lava icon, and it has a number one on it. So this could be up to number three. Um, but what that means is that the uh, volcano will start, the lava will start flowing out of the volcano. You can see there's essentially, uh, over the course of the game, a path that's created by the players. So what, with a number one, what you'll do is you'll just draw one tile and then it would go in that space. In this case, I actually got a dormant volcano tile, so nothing would happen. This one would just get discarded out. But let's say we flipped over this one. Then we get a lava, and you can see actually as a plus one, so you would flip another tile there. And that would be, you know, the lava is now trying to catch up with the uh, players. So, like, if, you know, eventually it would just keep moving along like this. That one wouldn't count, obviously, until... Wow, that would, that would be an amazing string of luck right there until it threatens to overcome the players. So again, if this lava ever caught up and met the players, then that would end the game and the players would lose. So, um, like I said, uh, the goal for players is to reach all the way down here. So over the course of the game, your, your supplies of your cars are going to run down and your supplies of your tiles are going to run down. So you're going to have fewer and fewer choices as it goes. And especially as these wild tokens run down, you really have to co coordinate more with other players to make sure that you're meeting the requirements on the card because most of the cards are going to force the lava to flow. Um, some other things that could happen on these tiles, and I don't have an example of the one let me just look here so you can see one thing that could happen is you could get this which is just a little bonus marker that just gets you another one of these tools which is fantastic but the other thing that could happen is this boat icon so whenever you 
move the tent onto one of those faces with the, the boat icon, you'll take the top one of these boat tiles and flip it over. So if there's already one there, you'll flip that over and you'll have to choose immediately between one of these two boats. And this boat will be what you're going to need to escape onto at the end of the game. So if you moved your path all the way down to here and then you moved on to here by paying those four items, you'll be in the clear to end the game. Although, these will also have on them uh, volcanoes at the end of the game. So if you've gotten onto that boat, but because of these volcanoes that were uh, face up on your last turn, the lava reaches the boat, you would still lose. So you have to actually get onto the boat, resolve the lava, and then you could move away to win. Um, so that's essentially how the game works. You're essentially going to be taking, you know, alternating between those two types of turns, uh, trying to, you know, use your resources in order to uh, reach the end of the thing. So you can see that there are some bonus tiles out here that if you snake the path into that, those tiles, you could get bonuses. So like here you would get an extra multi-use tool, here you could get a new boat, or you could flip another green tile. Um, and then the, uh, I should note also, because of the way these tiles come out, often you'll have to snake the path, or you know there might be a tile on there that's a straight line that you that has a number three volcano on it. So you might snake the path just to avoid playing that tile and advancing the lava towards your, your boat. So there are some strategic considerations to be made over the course of the game. Um, some other things that could happen uh, during the game are that during the, uh, after the uh, evaluation phase, so after you've moved the TED so it reached the Explorer, before you go into the next real-time phase, you could actually turn in um, or take extra lava tiles to get these these bonuses up here. So I'll just show you that on the the board. So you can see up here on the board there are these little symbols here. So you could do any of these things in order to get um, uh, you know you could choose any of these things if you're willing to take an extra lava tile. So you could take an extra two green tiles. You could take a wild tool. You could add another one of these, which you might have to if this is on the last space. Um, you could take another two cards to distribute among players, or you could bring out a new boat. So those are all options that you could do between rounds effectively, but the cost is that another lava tile will get added to the chain. So uh, this is one variant that is in the game, essentially these you know, bonus tiles that you can get, they make it very slightly easier. The other variant is tied to the other side of the board, and this definitely makes it harder. So on this side of the board, there are certain um, special landmarks that are pre-printed onto the board. So there's a lake and some parrots and so on. And what you'll do is there's a deck of cards with those symbols on them. So you can see there's monkeys and you know the lake and the parrots and so on. And what you'll do is you'll take a number of these depending on how difficult you want to make the game. I think the baseline difficulty for the variant is take three of these and you will uh, reveal those and in order to win, you have to actually cross through those given spaces. And again, you can make this easier or harder by ch changing the number of these cards that you have to hit those locations during the course of the game in order to be able to escape. So that could definitely make it harder. I will say that uh, this is definitely not the easiest game, and it depends on how well your group cooperates. But uh, certainly that lava could you know move up very quickly, especially with those plus one tiles. So... Um, I have not yet won with that variant, but uh, it is good that it's in the box as a, as a uh, way to up the uh, challenge. So that is basically how you play Red Peak. Okay, so that's Red Peak, and as you can see, this is a really straightforward cooperative family game, and I think that's really to its strength. I, I tend not to be the biggest fan of cooperative games on a personal level, in, especially ones in where one player can quarterback and really dominate how all other players make their moves. This one, because of the way that uh, information is kept private, limits that, I think, a great deal, and uh, as does the uh, real-time element of the game. Because it's a real-time um, game, Player one player can't simply plot out the optimal move for all players. It requires real communication among the players, which for a family game is a real asset. Um, I think that the straightforwardness of the rules is a real asset, as is the runtime. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes to play. Um, you could certainly have really terrible luck right off the bat in this if a lot of those uh, lava flow plus ones come out successively. You could die really quickly, uh, as I found out. But uh, generally, that's not going to happen, and it's going to be uh, one of those games where 
you know, it's a you're in a within a turn or two of winning or a turn or two of losing. So it'll always usually be a nail biter right up until the very end. And I think that that's good. Um, it's a game that I think that does not have. A tremendous amount of variety in the box. It's it is what it is, I think. But because of the runtime, it doesn't feel repetitive in the times I've played it. Um, especially because it's highly interactive. Every player is always going to be involved, trying to contribute what they can um, to the team to go. You know that one extra tile. Um, and there, for a game that's this simple, um, I find it to be surprisingly hard. That might say something about the people that I've played it with and our ability to cooperate. But uh, generally speaking, there are real strategic decisions to be made during the course of the game because although you might want to go directly straight down towards the beach, uh, doing so might cause three tiles to come out, and that's a real risk you may not be willing to take. So you might do a snaky route uh, just to do that, or maybe just to get an extra bonus tile, hope, hoping that that will give you maybe uh, you know the leg up that you get that you need to get to the end of the the uh, beach. So um, there are some really interesting design decisions possible in this, and I do like that can scale. You could certainly, like I said uh, during the rules explanation, you could play with open hands if you're playing with a you know with with children or whatever. If you wanted to just um, you know teach the game, Th those are very obvious options that could make the game easier. You could put out those bonus tiles to make things a little bit easier. You could you know give yourself double time if you wanted to. You know you could really scale this. Uh, to be as hard or as difficult as you want it to be. You could, you know, like I said, you could require that you hit every landmark on the hard side of the board if you want to make this a really challenging game. But at its core, no matter how easy or how hard you make it, it's going to sit in that same 20 to 30 minute sweet spot, which is really terrific for a family game. It won't, you know, nobody will play this and feel like they were bored during their play of it, which is terrific. So, like most games by Ravensburger, it's been really well developed. The, um, the rules are very clear. The graphics are nice. They're really um, obvious what everything does. Um, there's no complaints on that front. I think the only real complaint that exists with this game is going to be um, that there are going to be players who just, by their nature, do not like hectic, real-time, chaotic games. Um, for me, if I'm going to play a cooperative game, I'd rather play one with a real-time element or, you know, whether it's Space Alert or Xcode or something that, you know, hides player information, avoids quarterbacking. Um, again, I think that that's something that makes everybody feel like they're contributing and, you know, that's generally a good design um, element in a cooperative game for me. But I realize there are other players who will just find this to be a total luck fest. Um, although I think that's maybe a bit unfair. That I, I could understand people say that, you know, Luck might pay, play too much of a draw or too much of an element in this game. So, so th I think generally from looking at the rules explanation, you would get a personal sense of whether or not this is a game that you would enjoy. On my, um, you know, on a personal level, I do enjoy it. I think that most people would be entertained by it. I don't think it necessarily has the longevity of something like Pandemic or what have you. But I feel like for a nice family game that you know is very good as an introduction to cooperative games. Um, it's terrific. I think that it does not necessarily feel dumbed down like some introductory co cooperative games do. I feel like it's a game that gamers could also enjoy, especially because it feels very solidly like a filler game. Um, so on those grounds, I would have to you know definitely recommend it. Um, and uh, whether or not it's a game for you, I think you'll be able to judge just by seeing how the game uh, works, you know, in my explanation. So those are my thoughts on Red Peak and thank you for watching.